We're here in Rio's favela Vigigal, which may be the most scenic of all the favelas in the world. There are many different explanations for why Rio has its many favelas. Perhaps the most common origin story goes back to the Canudos War of the 1890s. A mystic, Antonio the Counselor, had been wandering around rural parts of Brazil gathering adherents. They formed a separatist community, perhaps over 30,000 people, which seemed to some, perhaps oddly, to be a threat to the newborn republic. One military expedition came to disperse the settlement. It failed. Another came. Finally, in the third try, the government got serious and really overwhelmed them with military power. The problem was the government wasn't entirely ready to pay the wages of those soldiers. And so they came here and camped outside of the capital, and a favela was born. The name favela itself reflects a tree that is native to the Canudos region, and so in some sense the name should remind us of those bloody battles. The coming of the soldiers to the hills outside of Rio also reminds us of the ability of power to attract people eager to get some of the resources, in this case, just their back pay. As we turn to thinking about the different ways to view the favelas, there are at least four different lenses through which we can view them. The first is quite optimistic. It reminds us that cities are places of opportunity that attract both rich and poor alike, and the favelas are just a way of providing cheap housing for poor people who come to Rio to find a better life. The second way of viewing favelas emphasizes the breakdown in rule of law. The people who live here have cheap housing precisely because they never had to buy the land. They took it either from the public or from private owners who weren't able to defend it. And within the favelas, the rule of law often breaks down, at least before pacification. So a second way of viewing the favelas is they are a reflection of the weakness of the public sector in Brazil. The third way to view the favelas is that they reflect the unintended consequences of seemingly benign public policies. In the 19th century, many of Rio's poor lived in corticos, in tenements down close to the city center. Well-meaning policies of the late 19th and early 20th century cleared away some of these tenements, but they didn't make alternative space available for the poor. So they moved here, they found space outside, and the favelas were born. The fourth lens through which we view favelas is inequality. These favelas coexist with remarkable wealth that is further down closer to the beach. This is one of the few areas in which poorer people live higher up and richer people live lower down. That inequality was baked into the history of Brazil. Let's not forget that the first Africans who came to Rio came here not because they sought urban opportunity, but because they came in chains. That inequality is still around us, and yet it is important that cities should not be judged by the number of poor people or the number of rich people in them, but by their dynamics, by their ability to transform poor people into rich people. Certainly, the story of the favelas is not yet over, and we don't know how it will end. But as I look around me and I see the energy and the ingenuity, I see, I feel the ingenuity of this place, of these people, and the ability once again of cities to offer a better life to people.